So yes, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar on um, citizen councils and uh, citizen deliberation. My name is Matthias Rumpf. I'm the deputy head of the OECD Berlin Center and I'm delighted to have you here all this afternoon, but I'm also very delighted to have uh, this distinguished group of panelists and speakers here today. Um, we have um, uh, this afternoon from the OECD, my colleague, uh, Claudia, well, uh, she is an expert in the field and she has uh, commissioned or has been uh, responsible for a report on the on the topic which we which she is going to present in in a couple of minutes we have uh, peter McLeod from canada he is um, leading uh, an organization mass lbp uh, which is organizing and managing deliberative processes for the past 12 years with the aim of bridging the distance between citizens and governments. I think this is what this topic is really about. We have um, from Brussels, um, Magali uh, Clovy. She is the president of the French speaking parliament of the Brussels region. I hope I got this right. And we have from the German Bundestag two distinguished members. We have Anna Christmann from the Greens, Bündnis 90. And we have uh, Helge Lind from the Social Democrats. Um, we will start off with a presentation by uh, my colleague Claudia on the report the OECD has, or she has written for the OECD, um, I think about a year ago, which is setting, which is bringing together the experience, the international experience on the topic on de deliberative uh, uh, approaches. And we thought this was timely because as you all, or most of you know, uh, in Germany, this um, topic is also on the rise. We have, uh, um, there has been similar approaches in ma many years, but now um, the German Bundestag has sponsored, I should say, uh, um, a citizen council on a rather broad topic. And we thought it would be a good idea to, to bring together some international experience on the, on the issue to uh, enlighten and maybe also um, refer to uh, in the German debate. And without further ado, I would like to give uh, Claudia the floor for her presentation. And Claudia, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Matthias. Uh, so as, as Matthias was just saying, my name is Claudia Khalish. I am uh, leading the area of work about innovative citizen participation at the OECD, where together with my team, we're really exploring and thinking about the, the future of democracy a little bit more broadly. So I'm going to share my screen here in a second. There we go. Can you, can you see that okay now? Um, so as, as Matthias was saying, what I'm going to present with you now is, as a bit of an opening and scene setter for our meeting here today are some of the key findings from this report that I co-authored with my colleague Yeva Chesnulatite called Innovative Citizen Participation and New Democratic Institutions Catching the Deliberative Wave. Um, this report uh, came out last June and it's really the first empirical comparative study of representative deliberative processes for public decision making. Um, so by representative deliberative processes, this refers to things like citizens assemblies, citizens councils, citizens juries, and so on. Um, and within this report, uh, we had collected all of the examples that we could find of, of these types of citizens assemblies and so on that have been used uh, and commissioned by public authorities. So there are 289 examples that date from 1986 until October 2019. They come from 18 OECD countries plus the international level. Uh, these examples come from all levels of government. Uh, through doing this analysis, we were able to identify 12 models of deliberative processes, uh, as well as 11 principles of good practice. Uh, and we also looked at three different ways in which deliberative processes are being institutionalized to become a more permanent aspect of, of our democracies today. And this will be a key part of what we talk about today, especially with uh, Madame Plouy's, um presentation later on about what's going on in, in Brussels. Um, 
So before I dive into too much of the key findings, I just wanted to take a minute to define kind of the key term of what we're talking about today, uh, because it's a little bit specific and it's maybe a bit different to some of the more participatory approaches to democracy that many people are familiar with. Um, so here, very specifically, we're talking about representative deliberative processes, uh, which are initiatives that are organized by public authorities and at the harsh of them sits a small but representative group of people that is chosen through random selection to reflect societal diversity uh, and they're tasked with developing recommendations to a specific public problem. Um, this means that they have the, the time and the resources to be able to deliberate, uh, which means having access to broad and diverse information. Uh, it means weighing arguments and considering different perspectives with an explicit aim of trying to find common ground. The idea is not to have just an aggregate of everybody's individual opinions, but for people to work together and to find where can we find a point of, of middle ground, where can we agree, uh, and to, to provide those collective and informed recommendations to the public authority. To make this sound a little bit less abstract, I have one or two examples to, to, to show you. Um, so some of you might have heard about the Irish Citizens Assembly. Um, this took place from 2016 to 2018. Uh, 100 randomly selected people, broadly representative of Irish uh, society, uh, deliberated for numerous months on, on five different main uh, questions, uh, one of which um, was about the question of whether the constitution should be changed regarding abortion. Uh, now, the citizens Assembly didn't just deliberate on yes or no, whether that should be the case, uh, but they provided a recommendation to the Special Parliamentary Committee about um, a suggestion saying that the legislation should change with specific recommendations for, for what changes should take place. Um, so that later on, when the Irish public went to vote in a referendum on the topic, um, they had a clear sense of, of what kind of change they would be voting for if they voted yes. Um, another example from, from your country, which is not even in our report yet because of the fact that it took place later, uh, later than our cutoff date for data collection, but I wanted to highlight it nonetheless because it's, uh, it's a really great initiative, the, the Bourguerette Democratie, uh, the Citizens Council that took place about the, the kind of the future of democracy in Germany in, in 2019 uh, with the 160 randomly selected citizens uh, that had deliberated for, for many days days and put uh, 22 recommendations to, to the president of the parliament, um, uh, the Bundestag, Wolfgang Schäuble, uh, recommending things such as institutionalizing the use of citizens' assemblies, but also more direct democracy, more combinations of deliberative and direct democracy, um, you know, also provisions to do with lobbying. So it was quite wide ranging about, about democracy and it was the kind of first national level process like this that took place in Germany and was the, the precursor to, to the, the citizens assembly about Germany's role in the world, which is just finishing up its, its work now. And I'm sure that will come up into our conversation later on. So these are the sorts of processes that we're talking about in this report and in this analysis. And so the three criteria that all of these examples have in common uh, are one, representativeness, uh, that participants are, are randomly selected and demographically stratified to be broadly representative of society. Uh, the second is deliberation. Now this is something which requires time. So we operationalized it as having a minimum of one full day of face-to-face -face meetings. And the third being impact uh, that we only were, were analyzing the processes that were commissioned by a public authority that would be able to then act on or respond to uh, the recommendations that come from citizens. Now, why did we call this the, the deliberative wave? Well, in, in doing the data analysis, we could see that this deliberative wave is something that has really been building over time. Um, so initiating in the 1980s, but really gaining momentum since 2010 and, and even more so the last couple of years. Uh, so I mentioned we, we cut off the data collection in October, 2019. Uh, with our team, we have been updating our database of all of the processes that have taken place since then. And we have about hundred examples so 
far and we're still in the midst of, of doing the data collection because we keep coming across new examples every single day still. Uh, and I think there are about 42 recent examples in, in Germany alone. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting to see that in, in certain pockets of the world, there's a particular um, move and momentum behind this trend. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from well, from the MPs who are here with us today, but also the questions that come up in, in the discussion about that afterwards. Um, because even, even at the time of this analysis, uh, we found that some of the, the greatest number of examples came from, from Germany, actually. Um, but most of those were more from the local level of a, of a model called the planning cell, which some of you may have heard of. Um, but we, we were really looking uh, all over the world, not just in OECD countries, although what we found was that most of these examples do come from OECD countries in the end. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we looked at all levels of government, uh, so we have around half of them come from the local level, 30% from the regional state level, 15% from the national federal level, and 3% at the international level. Um, I do want to caveat that, uh, that most of those regional state examples come from Canada and Australia, which are both very federal countries, and a lot of the issues that were tackled at that level of government there would have been considered national level issues in, in most European countries. So I just want to specify that because I think there's sometimes a bit of a myth that this form of citizen engagement is not appropriate for the national level, whereas actually we have quite a lot of examples of it being effective there too. Um, one of the main questions we were interested in finding out about was what sorts of, of policy issues are these processes being used for and, and what are they well suited for? Um, so in the data, we found that the, the top types of policy problems um, where representative deliberative processes were, were used to help find solutions uh, touched on issues of urban planning, health, environment, strategic planning, infrastructure. Um, but in doing the analysis and, and also doing some more qualitative work around, um, around trying to better understand this question of when should one use a deliberative process, we found that there it's more about thinking the types of problems that deliberative process processes are well suited to address. Um, so there were again, three characteristics that came through about that. The first being values-based dilemmas. Uh, so even though a lot of questions seem very technical in nature, uh, actually a lot of public problems are underpinned by values questions, ethical dilemmas, questions that really bring to the surface like what kind of society do we want to have? Um, the second being complex problems that require trade-offs. Um, so these processes are really helpful when there's really multiple different ways forward and there's lots of different considerations and trade-offs to take into account um, and trying to find uh, a sort of middle ground and, and compromise between them. Um, and the third type of, of issues uh, where these pro processes can really be helpful are, are long-term questions that go beyond some of those short-term incentives of elections. Now, off of the back of the empirical analysis that we did for this report, but also working with an expert advisory group of practitioners, public servants, and academics, um, and actually Peter McLeod was one of these, <laughs> one of these experts, we developed collaboratively the OECD's good practice principles for deliberative processes for public decision making. Um, these, these principles also did go through a public consultation, and then they were discussed and approved by the OECD's working party on open government and our public governance committee so they've, they've kind of gone through many layers of, of discussion and, um, and analysis but what we're trying to recommend with these principles is really a guide for, for policymakers and for practitioners that at the end of such a process there's a set of recommendations that come out of it which are collective and informed um, you know something that is actually useful for the policymaker at the end of the day but at the same time for these processes to be designed and organized and delivered in such a way that can inspire public confidence and trust um, both in the outcome, but also, I suppose, in a more normative sense in terms of trying to restore a better relationship between government and citizens. So I won't have, I don't have time to go into these into depth right now in the presentation, but I'm happy to pick up on any of this in detail in the questions if that's of interest to, to people here today. Um, because I did also want to touch a bit on the, the benefits of representativeness and deliberation. Um, so on the basis of this analysis, we identified seven key, key benefits. Um, the first being better policy outcomes, uh, because deliberation results in public judgments rather than public opinions. 
Uh, the second being greater legitimacy to make hard choices for public decision makers. Um, third, there's the potential to enhance public trust in government and democratic institutions by giving citizens an effective role in public decision making. Fourth, is that the way these processes are designed and executed really signal civic respect and empower citizens. Um, they make governance more inclusive by opening the door to more representative groups of people because of the, the, the random selection process. Um, they strengthen integrity and prevent corruption by ensuring that groups and individuals with money and power cannot have undue influence on a public decision. And then finally, there's also emerging academic evidence that's been looking more into how these processes can also help to counteract polarization and disinformation. Finally, the thing that I, I wanted to also touch on briefly in this presentation is, is the kind of third pillar of this report, uh, where we looked at in what ways there's been a, a shift to move beyond an these ad hoc processes towards redesigning democratic institutions and making sortition, the random selection of, of citizens that is, um, and public deliberation more of a normal part of the way that certain types of public decisions are taken. So in the report, we identified 17 examples that correspond to three different approaches to institutionalization so far. Um, the first being a, a permanent or ongoing structure for representative citizen deliberation. Um, and uh, Magali Provi will give one example of this in greater depth later. Um, the second being requirements for organizing representative deliberative processes under certain conditions. Um, so by that, I mean, for example, the 2011 uh, French law for bioethics, which requires having a quite rigorous and intensive public deliberation before any changes or new laws about bioethics can be introduced. And third being rules allowing citizens to demand a representative deliberative process on a specific issue. Uh, so this is often in the form of uh, petitions that require a minimum number of signatures which can then trigger or initiate a, a, a deliberative process to take place. So these sorts of rules uh, exist already within the regulations of numerous uh, local authorities in Poland as well as the Austrian state of Vorarlberg. Um, and I just wanted to give one example of the permanent or ongoing structure for representative citizen deliberation to, to illustrate what I mean by this. Um, and that's from the, the German speaking community of Ostbelgian. Um, so this is a region that has its own regional parliament. It's a region with about 80,000 people. So it is the smallest region of Belgium, but nonetheless, there's a lot of interesting democratic innovation happening there. Um, so the parliament in this region in February, 2019, voted unanimously, meaning across party lines, to implement this new um, democratic institution of a citizens council, uh, which consists of 24 randomly selected citizens who play an agenda setting role. So it's up to these citizens to decide what are the issues that should be put to a citizens panel. Now, each of these citizens panels is also a deliberative process like the kinds that I was just describing in this presentation. So with 25 to 50 randomly selected people, they have to meet for a minimum of three times over the course of three months uh, with a task of providing collective recommendations to the regional parliament. Uh, and the parliament has to have at least two debates about these recommendations, uh, which means that the second role of this citizens council is to actually monitor uh, that these debates take place and the implementation of the recommendations that end up getting approved. Um, now, the first citizens panel that took place under this model was about how to improve the, the working conditions of, of healthcare workers in the region, uh, which is also interesting because they chose this topic before the COVID crisis happened, uh, which I think is also one of those demonstrations of why you can trust citizens to bring important issues to the table that they, they feel are not getting enough um, political debate otherwise. So I just want to leave you with three kind of key messages off the back of all of this information. Um, the, the first being that the deliberative wave has really been building over, over time. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what works, which we've, we've tried to encaps encapsulate within the OECD's good practice principles. Um, the second message is that deliberative processes are by no means a silver bullet. But we also have the evidence to show that if they are designed well, they can help to solve hard public problems and increase public trust. 
And then finally, a key trend to follow is this move from projects to permanence, the institutionalization of public deliberation and how this is changing democratic institutions and a little bit more broadly, how it could potentially change that relationship between citizens and government. So I would really encourage you to have a look through the full OECD report. Uh, I've given you a little bit of just the highlights of what's a 200 page publication. Um, so thank you very much for your time and I look forward to, to answering your questions later on. Many thanks, Claudia. Uh, maybe one follow up question right now, if I may, it's already coming from the chat where we have a couple of questions is why, where's the difference that's coming from between different countries? Why are so, some countries very in this area and others are not? Is it because they feel that the gap between public and politicians has widened too much that they have to do something? Or is it the opposite? That the countries which always where the, the relationship uh, between, uh, between citizens and government is largely attacked or perceived as being attacked are the ones which are moving forward on this, or is there no correlation between those two aspects? Mm. No, it's a very good question. I wouldn't say that I have a, like, um, a concrete response in the sense that I have a hypothesis and one that we explored in the report. I mean, Peter might have a, a notion about this as well because he's been working in the field for a long time and actually in one of the countries where we've seen uh, some of the largest number of examples in Canada. Um, but from what we found in doing this research is that in many countries where we've seen the largest number of examples, um, it, it was actually initiated, the very first instances were more dr uh, driven by academics um, who were wanting to test some, some academic models um, but then with a push to connect that to policymaking. Um, and over time, I think in, in the countries where there have all been all of those initial demonstrations of how this can actually help to solve public problems, uh, we've seen that there has been inspiration drawn by, by one politician to another of being like, oh, actually, this works in the sense that we don't want to just do something innovative. And I think it's actually been less driven by this sense of, of that kind of normative democratic desire than just more like wanting to do, solve problems better um, is, my, is my sense of things. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. I think we will come back to this in the discussion afterwards. Now let's move to Peter McLeod. As I already said at the beginning, he is the founder of Mass LDP in Canada. An organization with, uh, and I think he personally also, with a long, really, really long and impressive uh, record in deliberative processes. If you look at the list of projects he's been running uh, in the country, it seems he's been running all the projects in Canada or even beyond. So really impressive. And I also uh, encourage you to take a look at their website. And he's uh, presenting on from a perspective of an of an organization which is managing those processes which has initiated those processes uh, the takeaways uh, he has learned over the past years peter the floor is yours well matthews thank you very much and it's, it's a treat to be able to join you from a very snowy toronto here in in canada uh, and always to follow my uh, my great colleague and friend claudia um, i i want to share a little bit of the canadian experience and it's true that you know, at mass, a kind of unusually named organization, we've been working behind the scenes for more than a decade to try and, and do a little bit of what Claudia just described, to move from projects to permanence and to try and make citizen deliberation part of Canada's democratic culture. Um, I, I want to share with you a little bit about this decade-long experiment in deliberative democracy, because I think parts of it may be instructive. I think... Uh, some of uh, what I'll share may also serve as a bit of a cautionary tale. You know, in Canada, at least, the, the story uh, begins more than a decade ago. It begins in 2003 in the province of British Columbia. And everything that has followed, I think, helps point towards what I've started to describe as democracy's second act. When we talk about citizens' assemblies, you know, they're often greeted with a lot of a lot of fanfare and, you know, positive, um, uh, I don't know, positive ideals of citizens gathering to take the time out of their busy lives and to do something that's pro-social, that's very civic. In Canada, there were two major citizens assemblies led by British Columbia and Ontario. And 
As you might be aware, Canada still labors under a first-past-the-post electoral system and enough pressure built up in one of the provinces that they decided to take a fresh look at our electoral system. Um, they convened almost 150 randomly selected citizens who spent the better part of a year looking at the voting system and ultimately proposing an alternative. And shortly thereafter, Ontario, Canada's most populous province with about 16 million people, also decided that it would look at its electoral system now in 2005. But if you think about Ontario as being more East Coast and British Columbia being more like California on the West Coast, the Ontario Citizens Assembly was greeted in a very different way. Instead of being heralded as a bold experiment in citizen democracy, it was castigated as a, um, a, a process that was inviting a bunch of people who knew nothing about how politics works into the center of one of the most critical decisions a democracy could make. And so greeted not only in the right-wing press in the Toronto Sun, we had columnists saying, ah, oh, this is just a group of people who have so little going on in their lives that they're prepared to spend 18 weekends discussing proportional representation. Well, maybe you'd expect this from the right-wing press. So we looked at what the left-wing press would say. The Toronto Star, another columnist said, ah, these are just people looking for some excitement in their humdrum lives. One of the most credible uh, academics at the University of Toronto's Department of Political Science called the entire initiative ridiculous. Well, this was the opening act for citizens' assemblies in Canada. And I think one of the important, very basic lessons here is that if you hope to introduce a new way of doing politics to a society, maybe it's not such a great idea to start by trying to rewire the entire political system, or at least powerfully change the incentives and opportunities for the politicians themselves, who of course have prospered in the existing electoral system. Uh, it's been what has allowed them to be successful and develop their careers. So the existence of the first two Canadian citizens' assemblies, I think, has had a much greater influence internationally. Certainly, it led to some of the work that has been so powerful in countries like Ireland. But in Canada, it forced us to regroup. And we decided that if we were going to try and, and make this part of our policy culture, then we would need to go backwards to go forwards. And for us, that has meant not looking for the affairs of state, the above the fold major political issues, but focusing, as Claudia observed in her study, on many more of the regional issues that in Canada, at least a highly federalized country, gave us access to important policy questions, but wouldn't be transacted really through the press in quite as prominent a way. And that's allowed us over the course of the past decade to run up the board, conducting about 38 different citizens' assemblies and reference panels in Canada. And the nomenclature is interesting here. You know, we call them reference panels often, in part because of the negative charge that got attached to citizens' assemblies. It looked to our politicians like these were a bunch of unelected people who were showing up to do our politicians' jobs. Well, by calling them reference panels, it's clear who's on first. The politicians can refer an issue to a group of randomly selected citizens who can refer back a series of recommendations. And the politicians, I think quite rightfully, remain the deciders. And using this model, we've been able to tackle such a wide range of issues. Um, condominium housing in a major uh, urban city like Toronto, uh, is governed by regulations developed by a reference panel. If you fly into Toronto Airport, the time of day, the uh, approach and profile that you follow was informed by a citizen panel to minimize noise on uh, adjacent communities. The introduction of very controversial health measures like supervised injection services for heroin users, that has also been largely uh, delineated and defined by randomly selected citizens working over many weekends to advise government on their priorities for reform. 
And slowly over the course of that decade, it has allowed us to come back uh, and, and take a more national stage. This is from 2016. This is 36 Canadians. If you were to bring them from the 10 provinces and three territories across six time zones and working in both official languages to advise the federal government on the introduction of its forthcoming pharmaceutical legislation, which would provide an expanded measure of public insurance for pharmaceuticals in Canada. And in the midst of the pandemic, of course, like others working in this space, we've had to virtualize our efforts. And here are a cross section of the 42 Canadians who spent 18 sessions this autumn advising the government on its forthcoming uh, policies to regulate social media targeting the effects of harmful speech. Interestingly, when we surveyed the members and asked them how they felt about having to work virtually in the midst of a pandemic, many of them reported saying that in fact, it gave them a sense of community and it gave them a sense of purpose at exactly a time when they felt most vulnerable and disconnected from family and loved ones. One of the things that I, I want to point out that I think builds on Claudia's study is that when you look at all of these different kinds of deliberative processes, it's helpful to break this way down into perhaps three categories. Three categories that I define as the constitutional. This is uh, the case in Ireland, for instance, where it actually has reformed its constitution on critical matters like reproductive choice and has used deliberative processes to resolve these intractable issues. Interestingly, and it's something we can pick up in the discussion, I'm not sure whether this was an instance of uh, public opinion coalescing around the issue through the deliberative experience as it was so much a way of consolidating existing public opinion and helping Ireland's parliament get past its own partisan impasse on this issue. I think what we're seeing in Belgium, which is so stimulating and so exciting, fits the second category about the reform of parliamentary institutions. So how can citizens take their place at the decision-making table either in, as we've seen, the West Belgian model, or by incorporating citizen seats on parliamentary committees to uh, help contribute to that discussion. Our work in Canada has almost exclusively focused on the regulatory side of this equation, and, and I want to spend my last few minutes focusing on why I think the regulatory world is actually so important for building this deliberative way. You know, our goal is actually quite modest. Um, there are many policymakers I know at this meeting today. And if you think about a standard policy sequence, seven eighths of it happens backstage. It happens within departments and within ministries. That's where the problems get defined. It's where the policy options get developed. And it's ultimately where proposals are created which only later on are brought forward to check in with the public through a consultation. Really what we're proposing is nothing more dramatic than building in upstream an opportunity for citizens through some kind of deliberative process to be able to help define that problem and articulate their values, articulate their priorities, and to propose some options which then can go through a policy development process and which then can go out to a broader public uh, through a more traditional consultation process. That's not to say that uh, assemblies and direct democratic mechanisms like referenda always need to be conjoined. What all of this adds up to, however, I believe is a different way of doing politics. It is fundamentally um, about enfranchising more people to do more than simply turning out every three or four years to cast a ballot. It is fundamentally about adding more seats to our decision-making tables. And, and that's why the deliberative wave in my mind is really the start of democracy's second act. And in our second act, it helps to remember that Democrats are going to have to confront exactly the same old adversary and foe that we have been pushing back against for the better part of 300 years. And that is the view of elites, that they are somehow more capable, more compelling, for whatever reason, 
authorized to make decisions for the rest of us. So let's just look at what happened in Canada when it came to simply securing something that we all take for granted now, the vote. We could describe the last two or 300 years as a slow, grudging process of expanding the circle of voters from men with the right title, born of noble birth, ultimately up into the 1990s for people with developmental disabilities. And we still haven't enfranchised, of course, children. The argument that is always deployed is an argument about capability. And those critics of deliberative processes will employ exactly the same arguments as we saw in Ontario and BC about the capability of citizens to exercise public judgment. It's been a very long road for Democrats, but we've got ourselves to a ratio that says one person, one vote. Yet on the other side of our democratic equation, we still labor under this very lopsided ratio that at the state or national level, there's only one representative for generally 100,000 people. And I think it's a very important question to ask whether this ratio can actually ensure sufficient democratic health for any of our societies. We often talk about democracy from the perspective of that one representative. Can they be effective? Can they represent enough concerns? Rarely do we ask about the opportunities for the other 100,000 people to cultivate the skills of citizenship, their own democratic fitness, by having the opportunity to participate in expanded and more purposeful ways. And that's why, coming back to my three blue circles, I think there will continue to be very important opportunities to use deliberation for the purpose of constitutional issues. I think there's great promise to reform our parliamentary institutions by incorporating citizens in their work. But I think it's actually the big terrain, the big playing field that's available to us when we look at all of the decisions, small and large, that government must make through its many agencies and departments and begin to recognize those as opportunities for citizen deliberation as well. My last point, whether in Canada or in Germany, we are all sadly aware that we are living in populist times that are fundamentally hostile to liberal democracy. That means that this work is not nice to do. It is increasingly a need to do proposition. It is an investment in the innovations that are required to secure our liberal democratic commitment. And this is as much a question of building a robust national security response to safeguard these institutions as it is simply involving people because we will get more responsive and better public policies. That's why in Canada, we've put forward a proposal called Game Changer. It seeks to scale up these processes across our 10 provinces and the federal government. It would seek to see about 80 deliberative processes happen each year at fairly minimal cost of about 10 million Canadian dollars. But I think unless we are prepared to advance some more audacious proposals for scaling up, we will continue, this, this wave will plateau, and we will be stuck having a terrific series of pilot studies, a terrific series of projects, but not achieving the permanence that's required. 10 years of working in the space has taught me that while people want a say, they're also willing to serve. One of the biggest challenges confronting our democracies is not that we've been asking too much of people, it's that we've been asking far too little. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, I would like to move on straight away to, um, and we will have more time in the discussion, of course, to, to go into, into details, but I think we move straight away to Magali Plovi. She has already been nodding and smiling a lot while you were presenting, I think. Uh, that's what I took away from uh, observing you, um, because uh, she is um, in Brussels really trying to do what you were um, suggesting. She's trying to, to, um, to institutionalize um, those processes within the um, French, uh, French speaking community and the capital region. Um, and we are very keen to hear what brought you there and how you got there and what are you trying to achieve? So Magali Plovy, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we do. Great. I would like to start by thanking the OECD and the Bundestag for their gracious invitation. I'm honored to be speaking amongst you and to speak out about my contributions to the derivative wave as it was uh, termed by the OECD. As you can all probably hear, I'm very, very francophone. I will present our work here in Brussels in English, and I'll do my best to answer your questions afterwards, but I hope you will forgive me if I switch to French for more technical content. My collaborator here will translate my answer for you. I would like to start by telling you a bit about the experiences that got me here and specifically about two episodes of my career that helped shape the Brussels Deliberative Committees. The first is my very first term as an MP in 2013, when I worked in the Parliament for 18 months. During this time, I started questioning the way that Parliament functions and more broadly, our representative system in general. I was able to further build upon these questions between 2014 and 2017, when I did a lot of work internally within the Belgian Green Party in search of alternative forms of democracy and potential openings to change. I work in parallel for the Center for the Fight Against Poverty, which really fed into my thinking about our democracy those who had access to it and those that it left behind. It's really the combination of these two experiences that led to me writing and presenting the text that we would make these committees a reality. Here's how the deliberative committees work. A committee can be called in two ways. Either MPs decide that a citizen contribution to a various public issue could be valuable, or the subject can come from citizens. Our goal was to give citizens the possibility to voice their priorities through citizen suggestions. By using a digital platform, democracy.brussels, as a complementary tool to the committees, citizens that have accumulated over 100 uh, signatures can post the suggestions online and campaign to obtain 1,000 signatures. When a citizen suggestion has obtained 1,000 signatures, it's then considered by the extended bureau as a subject for an upcoming deliberative committee. There are mixed committees, which means that both citizens and MPs sit on them. We are very wary of the power dynamics that operate in these kinds of situations, where most MPs are career politicians with experience in public speaking and the knowledge that he or she has acquired through this experience. We made the participant ratio three citizens to one MP in the hope that we not only to overcome these dynamics, but also to put additional pressure on MPs to listen to what citizens have to say and ultimately to make the citizen-led dialogues rather than the other way around. To sit on the committee, citizens must be residents of Brussels and 16 or over. There is no time limit linked to residency as with the communal vote, for, ex for example, nor is there a nationality requirement. People who live in the city have a say on the city. The citizens are chosen by two separate random draws. The first time around, 10,000 invitations are sent out to residents of Brussels, and then from those who answer, the 45 participants are selected based on social, demographic, and geographic uh, uh, aspects, among other criteria. Depending on the deliberative committee subject, some criteria can be aided by the support committee in charge of overseeing the smooth functioning of the process. The only criterion of exclusion 
is applied during the second round and it excludes anybody who currently holds a place in public office. So an MP, a minister, a mayor, and the Memphis present are the ones to sit on another relevant parliamentary committee. If a deliberative committee is called regarding, uh, for example, mobility, then the MPs that will sit on the deliberative committee are the MPs that sit on the mobility committee. Once the participants have been chosen, we enter the preparation phase during which a general information session and different preparatory sessions are organized with specific target groups in mind in order to accompany those who are further removed from participation from the get-go and equip them with the confidence and tools they need to appropriate the process as they own and fully commit to it. We make exclusion, inclusion, not exclusion, inclusion, a major focus whilst writing the regulations of the deliberative committee. The wet on draw allows us to delve deep in this population, but it's not enough. An extensive amount of work went into making sure that this group, composed of part of the population that wouldn't usually invest in this sort of initiative because of a lack of time, information, or means aren't left behind as is so often the case, but rather are given the opportunity to contribute and have their voices heard. Several preparatory sessions will allow for tailored information adapted to the needs of different groups, and more specifically for the four groups we are targeting, so young people aged from 16 to 20, people that live in precarious conditions, people that have a disability, and single parents. The actual convening of the committee happens in three phases. Sorry. During the first phase, experts from various backgrounds selected either by the support committee or by the participant themselves address the committee as a whole in order to ensure that all members have an equal amount of knowledge on the subject and can enter discussions with an informed opinion. The second phase is the deliberation phase. MPs and citizens sit down and discuss. They exchange their points of view, their life experiences, their different perspectives, so that during the third and the final phase, they can write a list of recommendations together for Parliament. Citizens and MPs then vote on each of the individual uh, recommendations. As I previously mentioned, the Belgian constitution doesn't allow for a citizen's vote uh, to have the same weight as an MP's one. In response to this, we did two things. To protect citizens, we made their votes secret. However, to hold representative uncountable and to make it harder to vote against citizens' recommendations, the MP's votes are public. On top of that, in case their votes differ from the citizens' one, they have to motivate this decision. We hope that this will put pressure on MPs to better work for, with citizens. Finally, if some or all of the recommendations are accepted, MPs that participated in the committee are then required to follow up on this recommendation within six months in Parliament with the rest of the plenary in order to stimulate the tabling of a motion. We will also manage to engage government officials in the follow-up process so that accountability is spread beyond the parliament. We believe that it will lead to better, more long-term decisions. Institutionalizing deliberation processes allows for representatives to settle sensitive issues that are caught in partisan gridlocks. By implicating citizens, the community's priorities can be better identified based on real life experiences and external pressure, such as those imp imposed 
by external groups are easier to overcome. There are also huge challenges headed our, our way, from climate change to lasting social injustices that are more accentuated every, every year. And we need to adapt our decision-making processes to this reality. It also ensures and solidifies public trust. These last decades, we have seen deliberative processes pop up all over the place, but it's really hard to determine if these have had a positive impact on the general trust people, afterward, politicians. That's probably partly in part because of the one of and ad hoc nature of these initiatives and the fact that they are limited to specific problems. Now I, that I have finished explaining the process and the reason that we have developed it, and so I can uh, answer to, uh, uh, to your questions.